My name's Tim Falk. Um, I have not been a Catholic for most of my life. Um, I was raised in the Episcopal Church and the Anglican Church, and maybe, I suppose it was probably about 10 years ago, I think I became Catholic. And, and not long after I became Catholic, I was talking with somebody, and they started asking me about my background, and they said, you're, um, you're, you weren't a cradle Catholic, were you? And I said, no. And they said, um, I could tell because you really know the Bible really well. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I was too ashamed to say that it was becoming Catholic that really opened my eyes uh, and my heart to Scripture. I had, of course, we were very devout. We went to church every week when I was growing up. And, and uh, so I knew the Bible and I had heard the Bible my whole life. But uh, until I became Catholic, it really didn't really open up to me um, until then. So I'm really pleased to be able to do this topic. My original title of this was Tim Ruins Christmas. If you remember that show, Adam Ruins Everything. Uh, I'm not smart enough to ruin everything, but I can ruin Christmas for you, I think. But Faye wanted something a little, a little, more, st a little more stately, so we call this a scriptural walk through, through uh, the nativity. Um, but um, so before we get into, before I start ruining things for you, um, we are going to be focused on, on, um, on the Gospels. And I want to talk for a few minutes just about the Gospels and maybe reinforce some of the things that were covered when we uh, went over the Scripture um, topic, if you remember that, a few weeks ago. So um, how many Gospels do we have in, the, in, the, in our Scriptures? Four. There they are. <laughs> Here they are, okay. Uh, Ma Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is the order that you find them in Scripture. Most people who study these things for a living uh, believe that Mark is the earliest of the four that, was, uh, at, that at least reached its final form. Uh, and uh, Matthew and Luke and then John. So uh, there's pretty strong evidence that Matthew, both Matthew and Luke had John, uh, Mark's gospel as a source because essentially the entire contents of Mark's gospel is found in both Matthew and in Luke, although not always the same way and not always in the same order, things like that. But you find Mark pretty much in its entirety in each of those two gospels. There's some evidence that uh, the author of John's gospel may have been, had some familiarity with Mark. So that's uh, quite a bit more tenuous than the relationship between uh, Mark and uh, Matthew and Luke. And then there's another body of common material between Matthew and Luke. Uh, now, Mark's gospel was probably completed maybe around the year 70. Some people think it was a little bit before. Some people think it was a little bit after. So maybe late 60s or 70. Matthew and Luke were writing more in the 80s of the first century. Um, their gospels were being composed at the same time with largely the same sources. They're, they're, they each have individual sources besides the two there. Uh, and Q, uh, Q is a, nobody, Q doesn't really exist, the document, but there's a body of material in both Matthew and Luke that's virtually identical that's not from Mark. So everything that's in both Matthew and Luke that's not in Mark, and it's, most of it is sayings of Jesus. Um, and so that's, uh, that's referred to as the Q source. And then there's additional sources that Matthew and Luke each had that you see. Um, but the two Gospels were being written at the same time with um, largely the same source material, and yet there's no indication whatsoever that either one of them had any familiarity with what the other one was doing. So they really were, were being composed independently of each other, but at the same time uh, with much of the same source material, which to me is kind of remarkable, but I'm kind of a nerd about this stuff. But. Um, I, think, I think most people would look at Matthew and say yes, that the work of Matthew's gospel 
uh, Matthew's Gospel is a very scholarly, uh, a very scholarly work. Um, Luke must have been a pretty, uh, pretty scholarly person as well. Yeah. Mark was the uh, scribe or the disciple of Peter, so he learned at the feet of Peter everything that Peter said about the Bible history of Christ, and he wrote down that narrative. And uh, uh, Matthew is really the only single, well, Matthew and John are the only direct sources. Uh, two parts. Luke, of course, was described to Paul. We think, we don't really know. But yeah, there's some tradition that says that, later tradition that points to that. So to give you an idea of Q, because Q is kind of this mystery, but here's an example of when we talk about the Q material that I hope you'll find familiar. Um, and so the Lord's Prayer, uh, which we find in both Matthew and Luke, is an example of uh, something that comes from the Q, the supposed Q source or the proposed Q source. And so you see the similarity there, but you see differences as well. Um, and then all of the gospel writers uh, were very thoroughly immersed in the Hebrew scriptures, too. So they're working uh, from the separate materials. They're telling similar kinds of stories. Uh, but, uh, but something that all of them have in common is a, a, an immersion in Hebrew scriptures. Um, and so as we look at the uh, as we look at the, the uh, infancy narratives now, or the account of the birth of Jesus, it's important to keep this in mind because it'll enter into our into our conversation. Okay, so we're going to start with a quiz. Uh, we don't usually do quizzes, but we're going to do a quiz tonight. So um, we're going to have a number, and I want you to just feel free to shout out if the answer. Uh, if you know the answer, or if you want to take a guess, go ahead. Don't be shy here. And don't look at the answer sheet. <laughs> All right, so which Gospels? We, we've, just, we've figured out there's four. Which of the four contain narratives of the birth of Jesus? It's Matthew and Luke. And if you did your, your pre-work that that Faye assigned you, you would have known that too. Okay, uh, so an angel appears to Joseph to tell him of the impending birth in which gospel? Matthew, Luke, both or neither? Matthew. An angel appears to Mary to tell her of the impending birth in... Matthew, Luke, both or neither? <laughs> it's going to be right one of these. Yes, it is. In Luke. <laughs> Joseph and Mary live in Galilee in the town of Nazareth. Which gospel tells us this? Matthew, Luke, both or neither? It's Luke. Jesus is born in Judea in Bethlehem. According to Matthew, Luke, both or neither? Matthew. Both. At the time of Jesus' birth, Mary is a virgin. According to Matthew, Luke, both or neither? Both. That one's both. Jesus is born in a stable or cave surrounded by animals. Is that described by Matthew, Luke, both of them, or neither of them? Neither. It's correct. Neither one of them mentions uh, animals or a stable or cave. Uh, the baby Jesus is wrapped in swaddling clothes and laid in a manger. According to Matthew, Luke, both or neither. Matthew. That's Luke. <laughs> the birth of Jesus is announced to nearby shepherds who visit the infant. You're really ruining 
Christmas. <laughs> Luke. Is a manger a stable? A manger is a, a feeding trough, but that's all that's mentioned. Three wise men come from the east to pay homage to the infant Jesus. Is it Matthew, Luke, both or neither. That one's neither. Never mentions how many there were. Mentions three gifts, but never mentions the number of people. Magi from the east pay homage to the infant Jesus lying in the manger. Matthew, Luke, both or neither. <laughs> that one's neither. In Matthew's account, they, uh, Mary and Joseph are in a house in Bethlehem, and Matthew says they went to the house where they were staying. King Herod plots to kill Jesus, so Jesus' parents escape with him to Egypt. That's Matthew. Joseph and Mary return with Jesus to Nazareth by way of Jerusalem. That's Luke. And um, Mary learns the ins and outs of raising a child with special needs. Okay, one last one, true or false. In the New Testament, the Gospels present a life of Christ or a historical biography of Christ. True or false. It's false. The Gospels were written in order to convey the good news of salvation and instruct Christians on how to conduct themselves in the way of Christ. So when we think about when I think kids are having fun with us here. When we think about the Christmas story and we think about the shepherds and the wise men and all gathered around in the stable and, and that, we're, what we're really doing is just, well, we're, we're thinking about things we've seen all our lives about Christmas and it's kind of conflating the two. But the Christmas story as we usually think about it is not... Uh, is not particularly scriptural, really. So, what are we to make of it then? What are we to make of the, the Christmas story? Is it a story or is it stories? Is, is, there, is there a Christmas story? Or do we have two separate uh, stories related to, uh, related to Christmas? Well, let's look into this a little bit. Um, Here's what the church teaches us about reading scripture and about the, the approach we should take, um, particularly when we're reading the Gospels. So what the church teaches us is that the doctrine and the life of Jesus were not simply reported, but they were, uh, but were preached so as to offer the church a basis of faith and morals. So when Catholic Christians are reading and studying the Bible, our goal is to search for the theological value of the Gospels and not get hung up so much maybe on, on, a, on historical things. So how should we take that then when we approach the Gospels? What can we take from those instructions from the church? There's a few points that jump out to me on this. Um, and the first one is that the Gospels are the result of apostolic preaching. We talked about the Gospels being written, and well, the early one being completed maybe about 70 or shortly after. John's Gospel, some people think it was 100, maybe a little after that. So other people think maybe in the 90s. But sometime between 70 and 100 AD, the Gospels came into the, the form that, that we have today. Jesus was... Uh, crucified about what year? 30, 33, somewhere in there. So you have this time period in between where what was happening? The, 
the good news of the gospel was being preached. Um, and in that preaching, the earliest point of, of that preaching was salvation. Salvation has come. That was what the Messiah was going to do. The Messiah was going to bring salvation. So that was the message. Salvation had come. And that salvation came through Jesus' death and resurrection. And that was the core message. Or if any of you went to see Father Ricardo last weekend when he talks about tell the story, that's the story right there. And then to that core message were added sayings and healings, and often with a, a, a allusions to Hebrew scriptures. So the Gospels really weren't written from front to back. They were written from back to front. It started with the events of Jesus' death and resurrection, and worked, it worked its way back as time, as time developed. And it's an important thing to keep in mind when you're reading the Gospels, uh, is that's really the direction they were written. So when we're reading the Gospels front to back, we're kind of reading them backwards, but um, it's an important point, and I want to give you a little bit of an example on this. I want to go to the book of Acts, the second chapter of Acts, and talk about Look at Peter's sermon that he preached on, uh, on Pentecost. Now, for the sake of brevity here, I've cut a lot of stuff out. This isn't the whole thing. But if you go and look at it, uh, you'll see that he's, uh, it's chock full of Old Testament references. But this is basically the core message. This is the preaching. This is the, this is the story. So Peter says, remember, uh, People are hearing the apostles, and it sound, they're sounding like gibberish. It's sounding like gibberish, and some people are saying they're drunk. They, and, but, but, and others are saying, well, how can they be drunk? It's early in the day. But they sounded like they were drunk, and then Peter stands up, and he says, we're not drunk, we're not drunk. This is, the, this is what we're saying. And so this is his preaching. Jesus was commended by God with mighty deeds, wonders, and signs. This man you killed, God raised him up. And God has made him both Lord and Messiah. I meant, to, um, I meant to highlight another one, sorry. We are his witnesses. We are all his witnesses. God's raised him up. So they say, well, what do we do? What should we do? And he says, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins and you'll receive the Holy Spirit. And if any of you remember the conclusion of this, little section in Acts that talks about how many people were, uh, were converted and baptized that day. So that's an example of the preaching. The core message of the Gospels is this. Salvation has come. It's come through the death and resurrection of Jesus. Through that, Jesus was made the Son of God, and, um, and now we, we are reaping the benefits of that. So when we talk about Jesus and we talk about the Gospels and whose son Jesus is it becomes an interesting question. If Mark really was the first Gospel written, the very first words in the Gospel of Mark are this, the beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So Mark is kind of giving away the ending in the very first sentence of his Gospel because he's saying who, uh, who Jesus really is. But if you look at Matthew's Gospel, the very first words in Matthew's Gospel are the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So you have in this, in Jesus, we have Jesus, son of David, Jesus, son of God. And when we start getting into questions like this, the big word that people who study this stuff for a living use is called Christology, which means the study of Christ. So you have Jesus, the son of Joseph, and you, you, have, you see in the gospel people talking about that. There you have Jesus, son of God, and we see that reflected as well. So you have this Jesus, son of Joseph, Jesus, son of God. Well, that kind of begs the question then, when did Jesus, son of Joseph, become Jesus, the son of God? And so if we look in scripture for the answer, here's one answer we find. It happens at the end of time, and we find that in the third chapter of Acts. And I'm not going to go through all of the reading, but trust me, what that is saying is that the Messiah, Jesus, becomes the Son of God 
at the end of time. We find other references that make it sound like Jesus becomes the Son of God at the resurrection. We find other references in Scripture that says it's at the baptism where Jesus, son of Joseph, becomes Jesus, son of God. We have other Scripture references that tell us that it's at the incarnation where Jesus, son of Joseph, becomes Jesus, son of God. And then we have other scriptural references that say Jesus was the son of God at the beginning of time. So without any guidance whatsoever, other than scripture, we can narrow it down to sometime between the beginning of time and the end of time, Jesus, son of Joseph, becomes Jesus, son of God. So we've got that narrowed down pretty well now, I think. Um, this is an example why you, you don't always find things just going by yourself in Scripture. That's why what the, the, the guidance the church gives us on how to read uh, Scripture becomes important. Uh, another example. What are the last words that Jesus says on the cross? If you're reading Mark or you're reading Matthew, that's exactly what, it, what they are. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Or in the... Um, um, Luke's gospel, it's Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. John's gospel, it is finished, are the last words. Now, Jesus may very well have said all of those words on the cross, but they can't all have been his last words. But they're all described in the gospels as, as the last words. So this, I, I'm going through this to illustrate the difference when we're looking at the gospels between reporting and proclaiming. In the gospel, the, the good news is proclaimed when uh, the apostles went out afterwards and started preaching. They would proclaim the good news, and what would happen? Some people believed and worshipped. Others rejected the message. What happened to Paul and Silas when they, uh, when they um, went to the synagogues at first? They got run out of town on a rail and got the lash more than once. So some believe and come to worship, some reject the message. This is, this is what they discovered as they went out and started proclaiming. And then in the Gospels, what you see is that response to the message gets pushed back into Jesus' ministry because they, as they were recalling the events of Jesus' ministry, they found the same thing. Jesus went out and preached. Some people believed and became his disciples. Did most? If you look, if you take what happened after the resurrection out of the picture and you just look at Jesus' three-year ministry, would you have to call it a success or a failure if you had to choose one or the other? You probably would not say it was very successful. He ended up with a small, a very small group of followers, and he ended up getting killed in the most horrific and degrading way there was uh, for a person to be killed. And um, so if you only looked at it from that, you would be saying this really wasn't successful. But then when you see what happened afterwards, it, it's a very different story. But you have, so you have this as they were looking back on the ministry and they were saying, geez, the same things that we're seeing happening here were the same things that happened in Jesus' ministry. So what, let's get back now to the nativity story then. Do we, have, do we have a story or do we have two separate stories? I think we have a story, a story, but I think what we have is a theological story, not a historical story. Um, and, and this is what I see as the, as the um, here's the theological story that happens. Um, an angel announces to the parents, uh, there's an annunciation to the parents about uh, where an angel reveals the birth that's about to happen. Uh, then you have in each of the Gospels, an extraordinarily brief recount of the birth itself. And, G and then he was born. And that's about it. But then they move on. Um, so after a brief reference to the birth, you have a divine proclamation being made to an audience. So in Matthew's account, 
with the Magi, what's the, what, is, what is the proclamation to them? What was it that they saw? They saw the star. And they interpreted that. And they went, what about the shepherds? What was the proclamation to the shepherds? They had a whole host of angels scare the bejesus out of them in the middle of the night. Okay. So each group is guided by that revelation to Bethlehem. They're one of the things in common. One of the couple of things in common from a historical standpoint between the two to Bethlehem. So um, what you have is in the Gospels this Christological moment, so to speak, this, this when did Jesus, son of Joseph, become Jesus, son of God, you have this being pushed back now to the time of his conception and the time of his birth. So we've gone from uh, resurrection to baptism, now back to birth. Um, now, the people who are called to this, the, the magi in the one story, the shepherds in the other, they come and they worship, and then what do they do? The magi give gifts, yeah. And th but th when they're done, what do they do? They pretty much disappear. You don't hear anything more about shepherds being the early followers of Jesus. You don't hear anything about the magi proclaiming this unless you watch... Um, uh, no, the, char the other Charlton Heston movie. Now I can't think of it. Sorry, I'm having a senior moment here. Um, anyway. They're, they're gone. Well, why do they just disappear from the scene like that? Was that Herod going to kill the Magi? We'll get to that. Oh, sorry. They disappear from the scene because when Jesus' ministry starts, how many followers does he have? He has none. He's out there on his own. So, so they've got to kind of get them, out of the, get them out of the scene, so to speak. So, uh, and then another vehicle you need is how to get them to and from Bethlehem. Because in, in Luke's retelling, where do they live? They live in Nazareth. So Luke's got to get them to Bethlehem. And what vehicle does Luke use to get them to Bethlehem? A census went out. And, and there's a lot of historical problems with that census, by the way. A lot of historical problems with that census. But that's what gets them to Bethlehem. And then Luke, at the end of it, says, and they went back to you know, they went back to Nazareth, uh, and, and that's the end of the story. In Matthew's recounting, they, live, they already are living in Bethlehem. So Matthew's got to get them to Nazareth. And how does he do that? They escape down into Egypt. And then when they come back, they can't go back to Judea because Herod still wants to kill him. So they go, to, they go to Galilee, and that's how he gets them to Nazareth. Okay. How far was Nazareth Well, um, it, nothing's tremendously far apart, but uh, Bethlehem is not far from Jerusalem in Judea. Nazareth is in Galilee to the north. And, of course, this, the, the, sec, the area between Galilee and Judea is populated by who the hated Samaritans, Samaria, separates those two areas. So it's, it's, it's a different region. There were different dialects. They were like kind of hicks, you know. It was like Galilee was like the, you know, when we laugh at people with deep southern accents kind of a thing. But, you know. Anyway, so I think there is one. I think there is, a, there is a nativity story, but I think it's a theological story. I don't think it's necessarily a historical story. We're going to...